Welcome to the Tanium sponsor video for this year's PowerShell and DevOps Global Summit here in 2021. It's great to be with you today and thank you for watching our video. We want you to know that Tanium is for creators. People who like you who enjoy automation and scripting, this is a platform that can really help take your code to the next level. My name is Ashley McGlone. I'm one of the speakers at the event this year, and I'm happy to be your tour guide as we explore more of the Tanium platform and what it offers for you as a creator. First question is, why Tanium? People might wonder. Uh, well, number one, for me personally, I worked for Microsoft for a number of years teaching PowerShell and traveling around helping customers automate, and I really enjoyed that. What attracted me to Tanium, however, was I saw something that I couldn't do with out-of-the-box PowerShell. Here was a platform that was going to enable me to take my scripts and run them at speed and scale across the entire environment without having all the headaches of firewalls and uh, remoting and um, <clears throat> multi-threaded type pro uh, programming challenges that I'd encountered with PowerShell. Now I was able to deploy those scripts uh, instantly across the entire environment and get instant results without all that and it brings it back in a, in a handy graphical interface and so I was hooked when I saw that. So Tanium is all about visibility and control. It gives you real-time access to see your machines, whether they're working from home, on the VPN, in the office, if they're just around the corner, down the street, or if they're across the globe. We give you not only the ability to see those machines, but to then take control of them as well. That's the benefit of the Tanium platform. So we also talk a lot about speed, scale, and simplicity. We do this very quickly. Within a few seconds, you can have results back from your script from literally hundreds of thousands of endpoints. So that's the scale as well. Just in, it's so easy. Literally, you can copy and paste your code into a text box and a form. You can deploy that code then to thousands of machines instantly. You can even scope that by computer groups that you want to target specifically by dynamic criteria. It's just a beautiful platform for automators. On top of that platform then, now that we've got that visibility and control, we have modules for everything from software deployment and patching to security to asset inventory that can even feed into Splunk or ServiceNow, lots of integrations. It's a fantastic platform for automators with a lot of module or workflow use case type um, scenarios built on top of it. And the Tanium platform is available in a number of uh, hosting options. We can host it for you in the cloud with what we call Tanium as a Service or TAS. You can have physical appliances in your data center or virtual appliances, OVAs, or you can even host it on Windows servers directly. So it's a very flexible for how you host the solution, and it also offers cross-platform endpoint support. So for the endpoints that you're managing in the environment, being at a PowerShell event, most of you are probably Windows shops, but I'm going to guess you probably got plenty of Linux and Mac around as well. So we support Windows, Mac, and Linux, also Solaris and AIX, even some older flavors. So we're a cross-platform uh, endpoint management solution where you can use your own automating scripts at speed and scale. And those scripts can be PowerShell, VBScript, Batch, Bash, Python, you name it. So <clears throat> let's take a look at Tanium. What I want to do now is give you an overview demo of what does the Tanium environment look like and what's it going to look like when you begin to automate with your own code. Okay, let's start off with a brief tour of the Tanium interface. This is the latest version of Tanium Server 744. And here you'll notice we've got a question bar. It's kind of like a Google search engine for your enterprise. So here I can, it tells me how many machines I've got in my, this is my home lab, so just a few machines here. But let's take a look here. If I go in and I ask a question like, give me a computer name, I even misspelled that, and IP address and operating system. And let's go ahead and throw in there Windows OS release. ID. This is what we call our natural language parser. And notice that even caught my uh, misspelling there. I click on it. And here in my home lab, it's going to pull up an inventory of my environment. Now, as it's 
pulling this up, notice how quickly the results come back. And, it, and you know what? Even when there's hundreds of thousands of endpoints, it still comes back very fast, just like this. So what you'll notice here in my home lab is I've got a number of operating systems of Linux, Mac, and Windows. I can scroll through the results and I mean, the beauty here is that I didn't have to know any PowerShell remoting or multi-threaded tricks to do this. This all comes back because there's a local agent full fidelity on each one of these endpoints. And we can see the results here and we can filter them by text and the results. Let's just do Windows and then if we've got this, maybe this is the data we want, I can just hit the export button and download that as a CSV and feed it to some other system. However, uh, here in Tanium, uh, the beauty of it is it's a single pane of glass and we have all these different modules that we can take advantage of. But you know what, before we even get into those modules, there's some other things we can do just right here. Off, We can take action. Remember we said that it's visibility and control? So I can actually uh, pick a machine here and deploy an action directly to that machine or multiple machines. And, and I can browse a list of packages and let's take, for example, quarantine. So let's say a machine is infected on the network and I want to apply a quarantine. I can do that with Linux, Mac, Windows, and then I can push out a package there that would quarantine that box and keep it from harming itself or others on the network, for example. So there's visibility. There's also control. So beyond that, then we have, once we've got this re fast, real-time visibility control platform, we've got all these workflows we build on top of it. What we just looked at is called Interact. There's asset inventory, and so you can get an offline asset inventory that's up to date and then pump that into ServiceNow or Splunk, wherever you want to keep your data. Let's take a look at these modules here. Notice we have the deploy module. The deploy module allows us to deploy software very quickly. And again, it doesn't matter if somebody's working from home remotely or if they're in the office on VPN. But one of the things I want you to point out here is the package gallery. And we just so happen to have in the package gallery a PowerShell core package, which we can deploy. And you notice when I expand this in my own lab here, it tells me I've got 12 machines that are install eligible. That means this is a the Windows flavor of PowerShell core. And I've got one that's already got it installed, but it's eligible to be upgraded. We can see the version. We can see the system requirements. And so this allows me to, I could then import this from the predefined package gallery and pull it into my own environment and deploy PowerShell core across the enterprise. Now, I happen to know uh, Jason Wasser, who's an employee here at Tanium, is a member of the PowerShell community. He built uh, this package and he also built some others. We just don't have them in here right now for deploying PowerShell core on Linux or Mac. He's even built a package that will take care of those legacy systems that don't have Windows PowerShell 5.1 yet. So you can deploy PowerShell here with Tanium. Makes it very quick and easy. Notice we have a number of modules that cover many use cases and workflows. Everything from threat response, which is our really popular for security. We've got comply for vulnerability scanning and compliance scanning. Uh, discover to find unmanaged endpoints out there on the network. So lots of use cases here that are beyond just your everyday core interact capabilities that we looked at. So that's a very quick overview of the Tanium platform. So now we're going to move on and look at some more PowerShell specific applications of Tanium. I hope you enjoyed that user-friendly interface of Tanium. And you saw in there also that it's not that difficult for us to go ahead and deploy, let's say, PowerShell Core and manage that from Tanium across the environment. A lot of people are kind of challenged with that right now. So now you can do that in Tanium as well. Beyond that, next I want to talk about arbitrary code at scale. And I really want to get into more details here and help you um, get to meet some people who are doing this already. I've got a couple interviews keyed up here for you. I want you to meet Scott. Scott is one of our enterprise service engineers and his customer, a large financial customer, presented him with a challenge of how to inventory all the scripts in their environment and to know if they were signed or not. So now we're gonna watch Scott's automation story. Uh, the story behind this is of course, Right, uh, organizations, especially financial services organizations, and a lot of them in general are um, 
wanting to find good ways to audit PowerShell in their environment to audit scripts that are laying around because IT makes them and leaves them all over the place and people make them and leave them all over the place. And it's hard to separate like what's malicious with what's not. So of course they want to sign everything, uh, which is, you know, a good practice unless you're somebody like me and you're like scared that they, you won't be able to make stuff anymore. Um, but that's kind of outside of what we have to deal with. But the main thing is, is um, they didn't really have a way to check their entire environment uh, for PowerShell scripts and the status of their signatures. And so uh, I thought of, you know, combining index along with a commandlet to get the authentic code signature uh, to see if we could solve that problem at scale. And the SOC came to me and said, no nothing that we have does this. So um, I built it. And so let me show you how it works. Um, this is it right here. And move that over. Okay, so the way that I've designed the interface for the, the sensor is pretty straightforward. I allow the users to add exclusions. Um, I'm going to change this probably going down the line, but right now this is how it is, where you can pop in a regular expression to match specific signature types and to not bring those back from the endpoints, which is really useful if you're expecting to see Microsoft signed items and you want to ignore them. And so that, that's what that's for. If you needed to add to it, you know, you could just do a, you know, that type of thing, which is a, another one they expected to find in their environment was Palo Alto type stuff. But like I said, that's just kind of the basics here. And by default, this excludes the Microsoft signatures and it does not show timestamps or show signed scripts. So really if a script is signed by anything, it's just not gonna show us. But because I wanna show you all the things that we can find in an environment, I'll go ahead and let it bring back all the things. On a particular endpoint, I, um, at, at my customer's environment and in my test environments, I usually find about 50 or so Microsoft signed files. And, um, you know, I'll pull those back and take a look at them. And when you execute the sensor, it's actually going to each one of these files and doing the get authentic code commandlet and pulling back the information. And it's letting you know, of course, the path, the name, uh, the status of the signature, you know, be it valid or not signed, and then gives you the issuer. And then another thing that my customer was asking me for was to show the file creation date because as they go and remediate these, they wanna see if somebody's creating a new instance of the file someplace. And uh, also that's useful for the, the last accessed. So I'm pulling all that information back, presenting it to the, the SOC. Um, uh, they love it as it is right now, um, they, they dig it, but yeah, there's some things I wanna tighten up on it, um, especially around the, the interface and that regular expression. I'm gonna add a checkbox there and uh, make it a little more clear what I'm doing. But anyway, uh, this is it in a nutshell. It, allow, it allows us to do things that weren't typically possible and before, um, you know, with Tanium, adding an, an entirely new use case for it. And uh, it's something that apparently, you know, according to my customer, uh, they didn't have a tool that could do. So I was happy to be able to provide that for them. Um, this is the nerdy bit, you know, just doing some, some uh, guardrails here, that type of thing. Um, I don't know how much how much weeds we want to get into in this particular recording, but um, um, you know this uh, is. I like the nerdy bit. Can I see the command line to the endpoint index? Sure. So this is query file path, and then mm -hmm. everything with PS ones. And then for every result, so it's going to take your query data, and then it's going to go like pick apart those file paths. Is there any sense of um, you know, how long does it take to execute? That, that was a great question. Um, from what I can tell, it takes about half a second to like a full second, generally speaking. Um, so I, it's not not instant, but it, it it's is. Not, it's not that bad. It's much better than I thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Historically, you know, pulling authentic code stuff out, I mean, I, I suppose it depends on how you're doing it, but sometimes I've seen that be kind of, you know, like a slow yeah. process. And that's why, you know, before I go ahead and do that authentic code, right, I put in a max size, 10 megs is a little mm -hmm. egregious, but, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things too, mm -hmm. that like, you know, you don't want it to go and, and get a .ps1 that's not really .ps1 and it ends up being giant and slows down right. everything, right? Or for example, 
um, like if it's over the, the limit um, to make sure that I just report that stuff back. So like, for example, here, as I'm like counting up uh, the responses, so say like I ran across a system that had, you know, 20,000 PowerShell files on it, uh, they want to know, instead of just mm -hmm. cutting off, they wanted to know that it, that it had, you know, over whatever limit I, they had set. So they could go back later and investigate those particular machines and say, why, why does this one have so much PowerShell on it? What, is this a developer's machine <laughs> or, you know, just something. I've got one more interview I want you to see. And this next is an excerpt from the GoTanium web show that I started several months ago. And this is an interview with Rory here at Tanium, who is maybe employee number 10. He's been here a long time. And he really has a passion for automation and PowerShell and Python, you name it. He's a uh, polyglot, so to speak. He enjoys multiple languages. And here I'm going to have Rory demonstrate for you some examples of how you can automate your own code inside Tanium. Rory, uh, it wouldn't be a custom content uh, show if we didn't actually have some kind of code on the screen, some kind of demo. Could you show us uh, a really, I know we'll get into the, in the class a lot more, but could you show us just a really quick uh, sensor demo? Yeah, sure. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and do that. So this is going to be really simplistic, um, but I think that's okay. I think seeing is believing. So if this is all working correctly, everyone should see uh, Tanium console um, as a test server. So if we go and ask a question, just, just to sort of sensors 101, so you know, get computer name and IP address. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a sensor that's something like computer name or IP address. Um, these are going to be really, really simplistic. Apparently, these have no IP address. Uh, there they go. So uh, what you're seeing there is the data sort of being fed in over time. And these are very slow uh, cloud instances, like on the cheap tier, just so everybody's aware. So we're going to go into sensor. <clears throat> and uh, so under administration and sensors, and we're going to create our own sensor with this new sensor button. So this, I think, is what TAS customers don't see, that you can't click the new sensor button. So if you don't have that, you can reach out and uh, to your account team and get, get that training and, and get that enabled. So we're going to write the world's simplest sensor, hello. So you can put, give yourself a category. Uh, you can change the result type. This is actually interesting. So it allows you to do sorting and filtering. Like we know what a version string is, so we can do version comparisons. We're not going to do any of that stuff. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to make a PowerShell sensor for Windows. And we're going to do, whoops, right, host. Hello, Tanium. And now you can see there's a certain amount of text that you can have for a sensor. You can't make a sensor like, absolutely huge. They've got to be really small. But I think this is a really important point. If you needed more space for a sensor, both PowerShell and Python are modular languages. So you can deploy your own PowerShell modules or uh, Python packages down to client disk in a package and then load them up in a sensor. So your sensor could be very, very small. You could just be calling a function into a very complicated and well-built uh, you know, uh, Python or, or PowerShell package. So don't let this character limit fool you. And then we're going to make a Linux sensor. So we could, again, we could do bash here and you just paste in some bash. Um, we're going to do a Python sensor. And we're going to use the Tanium results object. So tanium.results.add. And then we're going to add hello Tanium. Now you can see there's a difference in PowerShell. It's just regular old PowerShell. Uh, right host is something we all understand. But on Python, we have this other way to get data into the console called tanium.results. It's an object and it's all documented in the core Python documentation. Um, so this is a really cheesy sensor. It doesn't do much, like I said, but it should produce the same results using two different programming languages. On the Python side though, don't you have to import tanium? There? Good question. So, so we always recommend that people do it only because it, if you're doing something in an IDE, it won't put the squigglies under the word tanium. Uh, it's actually not necessary and it happens for you automatically, but we can do it. So you can do import Tanium. Now, that being said, like this is real Python. So if you had to do import, uh, import OS, anything, a whole Python standard library is available to you. Um, Tanium is a special module. It just happens to get imported automatically for you. Uh, but I'm glad you asked that because it's not obvious. So we're going to go ahead and save this sensor. And hopefully, if I did everything correctly, it'll execute. So I'm going to ask. Get, uh, let's see, get OS platform and hello Tanium. And that's going to get it from all the machines. And we should see data populate here. Again, apologies. This is like the 
this is the cheap seats, this cloud instance. Uh, you can see here's the Windows machine. We should see the Linux machine. There we go. So we saw the same string pop out in two different programming languages. Uh, and if we were to go change that sensor code, it would be it would be changed on the next go around. Uh, and you know that's that's sort of sensors in a in a nutshell. In an emergency, just a few lines of you know Python or Bash or PowerShell or whatever, uh, that could be thousands of dollars a minute. <laughs> so really really important uh, to be able to know how to write sensors if if you can do it. And that's fantastic because that's the whole value proposition of Team. We sometimes we we get used to Team Core and Interact and say, oh, it's just Interact. This, the real business is in the modules. But no, this is a real legit business case. I can extend this platform to do anything I need in my environment. And the really cool thing there was I was able to write cross-platform sensors and packages with one item in the, you know, one sensor can hit any one of those OSs, you just drop the code in there. I mean, and that's phenomenal. You know, that's absolutely phenomenal as a, as a value prop for the whole platform. The whole goal is if, if customers are already familiar with sysadmin level programming languages, you know, why make them learn something else? More than just automating code within the Tanium console, you can also integrate with other systems in your environment. Tanium does a fantastic job of this. We have an API that you can use to hook into Tanium. There's even, as part of my session this week at the conference, I did a little bit of a demonstration of how Tanium can uh, surface up key machine information for your own scripts. But here we've got a demo with Alicia, and she's going to show you how the Tanium API works and using VS Code on her Mac even, it's not even a Windows machine, she's going to show you the TanRest module and a simple example of what you could do. And imagine as you're watching this video, other types of integrations that would be possible leveraging the Tanium API. There are a number of them that are very pop, uh, popular, including the uh, security orchestration, automation, response, the SOAR platform. If you're familiar with that and your SOC, there are a number of different security tools that do orchestration. So if you get an alert on a machine that's got an issue, a vulnerability, then you can turn around and automate the quarantine of that machine or the remediation of that machine. So take a look at this video now with Alicia as she shows us the Tanium API. I'm Alicia and I'm an enterprise services engineer here at Tanium. What would you do if someone asked you to create five computer groups in Tanium? What about 50 or 500 computer groups? While this can be done in the console, today I'm gonna to show you how the TanRest API can help you automate these more tedious tasks. For this, you'll need the TanRest zip file, which you can procure from your technical account manager. Please make a note of where you save this file because we'll be using it in our tutorial. Let's get started. So here on the left, we have the old way of doing things. And as you can see, most of this code is spent establishing the web session and parsing out the session key, which we need to use in order to make other API calls. And with the TanRest module, a lot of this code is abstracted away so that you can just focus on doing the work that you need to do. So the first thing I'm gonna do is import the TanRest module. And I have the path where I downloaded TanRest onto my machine locally. In order to get this zip file that you need, you're going to need to reach out to your TAN. So now that I have the module imported, I'm going to run this just to get the functions loaded up. I'm also going to copy over the Tanium server URL, which we still need to pass in when we're trying to set up a web session. And I don't need the API v2 stub. That's just only applies to the old way of doing things. So now I can go ahead and create this web session. So web session equals, and the way that I do this is by calling the function new dash Tanium web session, which was imported in when we imported the TanRes module. The Tanium web session takes in all of these parameters. The only one that we really need is server URI which is our Tanium server URL that we just declared. And I'm also going to pass in the disable certificate validation because I'm in my home lab and I don't have certificates set up yet. So now we have the web session established and I can go ahead and start creating my management rights group. So in order to do that, I'm going to copy over this data and the data that I need, I've 
took that from the API documentation. Each, uh, each call, if it takes a parameter, is going to have a different format for what it needs. So definitely refer to the documentation for that. So here I have old API test. I'm going to just call it tanrest test group. And now that I've declared my data, the way that I create a new management rights group is by calling another function, new dash tanium. And anytime you're creating a new group or asking a new question, it'll be prefaced with new dash. And I know that mine is called new dash tanium core management rights group. Again, it shows me the parameters that I need to pass in. So I need to pass in data, which is the JSON that I just declared up here. And obviously I need to pass in my web session, which is the first thing that we established. And with that, I can run this and get back the ID. So oh, first I need to just pass in my credentials so that this can actually log in to Tanium. And we get back the ID of my new management rights group. Now that we've created a computer group using the Tanium core management rights group function, we can use a PowerShell loop to iterate over any number of computer groups that we need to make. For any additional information, please reach out to your technical account manager or find us at community.tanium.com. Thanks for watching. Not long after I came to Tanium, I wanted to really fill a gap that I had observed in the world of PowerShell automation. And that was around managing the security policies of PowerShell for auditing with transcription and event logs, and even simple things like just enabling or disabling remoting. So I built a toolkit to manage PowerShell policies at scale. Not only that, but to clean up those policies, to clean up after the transcriptions. You don't want that to fill your hard drive how to in automatically increase the event log size for all those PowerShell logs once you start recording to them, a number of other housekeeping things. But then beyond that, once you've got all that logging turned on, how do you find the bad code, the needles in all those thousands of haystacks? I'm going to give you an idea of what you can do with Tanium in the world of PowerShell security in this next demo. So now I would like to show you the toolkit that I built for managing PowerShell security at scale with Tanium. So we're going to start off here by just asking a question, is Windows? So for all the endpoints in my enterprise, I'm just going to target the Windows boxes. We could make this more specific, you know, making sure we had the right PowerShell versions, but I'm just going to target the true machine. So is Windows is true for all the machines in the environment? I'm going to deploy an action. So remember, Tanium is about visibility and control. Here I'm going to look at the PowerShell policy set right here. So imagine using GPO to do something like this, but instead now, instead of doing GPO, which is limited to only domain joined machines, or maybe you have 64,000 Active Directory domains. So this takes all that out of the picture and it makes it very easy to set the exact same registry keys that group policy does. And now we can enable PowerShell transcription, script block logging, module logging, and also set the event log size because by default, the event logs default to 15 megs, which is not very much. So we can default those up to maybe a gig instead so we can get more data. So here are all the parameters then to configure PowerShell logging across the enterprise. After that, uh, then I might want to harden those logs as I've recommended before. I can harden transcription and I can harden the event logs themselves, the Windows event logs, so that they're hidden and the transcription files are hidden, that whole directory, and then they're hardened where nobody has access to it except the admins. And then once you've got transcription running out there in the environment, you probably need to clean it up so you don't want to fill up the hard drive with transcript files. So here you can give it a retention time and days and you can put all these actions on a recurring schedule. So then, once those actions are running in the environment, uh, we can get some information, such as, uh, let's take a look, actually a little sidebar here, let's go take a look at PowerShell remoting in the environment. So here I can see a list of what OS, is it server or workstation, because remember, remoting is enabled by default on servers. So here I can see server versus workstation, the OS, and is PowerShell remoting enabled? hey, that's pretty quick. And then I can just click a box and drill down to get a specific list of machines. 
I can also look at PS session configurations. We've talked about remoting and GIA in my conference session this week. Here you can see I've got a Contoso GIA custom endpoint that is non-default defined in the environment. So that's pretty cool visibility for uh, remoting management. Now let's take a look here also if we take a look at the PowerShell policies that are in place. So group policy, you can set the policy in the environment, but the visibility to see what's actually there sometimes is kind of difficult. Um, RSOP being deprecated and things like that. So what in, you can do in team is get visibility then to see here's the OS's, the PowerShell versions, the PowerShell feature V2. Is that V2 feature enabled, which would potentially offer a bypass for PowerShell policy? See specific PowerShell versions. And to date, this is only for Windows PowerShell. So we can get an inventory of that in the environment. And then also we can audit the policy settings. So here we can see that transcription is enabled. Here's the output directory that's assigned to it. We have invocation logging turned on. It's hidden. It's hardened. We have a file count rounded off to 100 to see, okay, if we're going to deploy this in the environment, how much space is it taking on the hard drive? How many files? And what's the directory size rounded off in 5 meg increments? So once I enable transcription, is it causing disk space issues? And then I can also see what's the oldest transcript file. Clearly, I've not enforced the cleanup on these machines in my lab on purpose. And then we've got script block logging is enabled, module logging is enabled. So we can see at a glance basically a registry inventory and file system inventory of the impact of those policies across the environment. Click a box, drill down on any one of those for more details. But then also we want to look at event log statistics. So down here I've got the Windows PowerShell log, which is where uh, module logging goes, and PowerShell operational, which is where um, both module logging and script block logging go. I can see <clears throat> the actual size and the max size. There's a little 16 meg discrepancy there, and you can ignore that. But I see what I've actually configured, uh, which machines, oh, look, this one is still at default size. I need to go increase that log size so it can hold more events. And then I can even inventory execution policy across the environment and see where it's been set or not. So this gives you a really some nice administrative surface to look at managing PowerShell policies across the environment. And then finally, the moment of truth is we need to know, okay, we've turned on logging everywhere. Is there anything bad in the environment that I need to be concerned about? So right off the bat, we see that, oh, look, somebody somewhere has run invoke Mimi caps. That's not cool. Uh, so curl, so that's actually one of the commands involved with Mimikatz, right? Some other helper functions involved with Mimikatz. So now if I scroll down, it'll show me which machine it was. It was my Win10 machine in the lab, and it shows me my command history here. Uh, it shows me, a, depending on which sensor I'm looking at, tells me where these commands occurred. This uh, showed up in module logging, and then I look over here. Uh, this one didn't show any commands. That's probably script block logging because Mimikatz will disable uh, script block logging at first when it's delivered in a certain way uh, using Empire typically. And so we can see here's invoke ninja copy, port scan, some other uh, maliciously typed commands that were put interactively in the uh, command history from PS readline. We scan that for malicious commands. So uh, that's a quick overview. Now I've got an idea of scoping out where malicious PowerShell is running in the enterprise. We also have other uh, features in our threat response module, which will help you alert on malicious PowerShell and the environment as well. So that's a quick overview of the PowerShell security content that I built for Tanium. There's also a full YouTube series out on our Tanium channel. There's a playlist for PowerShell security with 52 minutes of in-depth training on how to use this and how to properly uh, administer PowerShell policies at scale with Tanium. I hope you've enjoyed this tour of Tanium today. And when we've sponsored the event in the past, many of you have come up to us at the booth and we've had some great conversations, but some of you were disappointed to learn that we don't service customers less than 5,000 endpoints. Well, I have good news for you. This year we started selling Tanium now to uh, organizations that have a minimum of 1,000 endpoints or more. So if that's you and your company, you've got at least a thousand endpoints, we'd love to talk to you and you can do a free trial. And there's a link for that coming up here at the end. I also have a number of resources for you. Some of the interviews that you've watched, we have extended versions of those. 
We have links to more information about the training that Rory created to help you learn how to create your own custom sensors and packages, and also a link to the Tanium trial. And that link is here at bit.ly Tanium PSH 2021. If you hit that, it'll go to my GitHub page where I've conveniently linked a number of show episodes that you can watch for more detailed information about PowerShell within Tanium and automation within Tanium, even Tanium on Linux and Mac and other platforms where you can get more information, find the free trial link there, and we're glad you've joined us for this tour of Tanium. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and we just want you to know that uh, Tanium really does support the PowerShell community because we're all about automation and security at speed and scale and helping you in the trenches, trenches of daily IT operations. That's where we thrive. So if we can help you out with that, we'd love to. Just let me know.